Chad Gill. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, uh, just, you know, living the joyous life of trouble-free contracting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so it's early where you are. Yeah, I figured we'd get the lie out of the way in the beginning. That way we set expectations right. Yeah. Set them low and knock them out of the park. Set them low and barely beat them. <laughs> barely beat them. But, uh, but you're here today to talk to us about contracting. I mean, you're, you are a contractor as well, and you've got kind of an interesting trade specialty. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that, you know, we're here today to talk about the business of business and your take on that, some of your experiences. Uh, people are about to meet you, but before they meet you, who the heck are you? And how is it you come to be speaking to this forward-facing group of uh, contractors around the world? Uh, well, you know, obviously, world famous, oh. very, big, very big deal, um, <laughs> mostly in my own mind. Right. Um, that's worn off on my children. They no longer are impressed. Um, but uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, I uh, it's my path to concrete polishing and, and stuff like that is a pretty, uh, pretty straight concrete path. Concrete polishing. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you know, I mean, it's the thing that's what, kids grow up wanting to do this all the time and I'm living the dream. You're living yeah. the dream. Yeah. I mean, we shouldn't <laughs> joke because you're doing very well in it. I love it. I do like it. Um, finding what you enjoy, you know, keeps you from having to work so much. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's still work, but, but no, I grew up in a farm rural community in Amelia outside of Richmond, Virginia. Um, made the trek from there. I, you know, went to college and I, I uh, had a couple of choices, but in one clairvoyant moment, I realized I needed a military college. So I went to Virginia Military Institute Nice um, for college, loved it, got into mechanical engineering. That okay. was like my thing, you know, spelling didn't count and numbers <laughs> don't have feelings. So I was like, perfect. This is where I want to be. And um, so the, uh, you know, I mean, engineers, we don't even require to talk to people generally. So it's, it's you know, it's good. Well, I mean, you're rare right there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so from there, you know, graduated there, degree in, in mechanical engineering, started doing robotics design for um, re for uh, maintenance work on nuclear power plants, which is one of the coolest jobs ever. Uh, I would imagine. I mean, it sounds like a MythBusters episode. It it was fantastic. Uh, got to do. I, I don't mind night shift. I don't mind long hours, and I didn't mind traveling. So that meant I got to get into a lot of places that. Uh, were above my pay grade. Um, you know, if they're like, hey, you know, we need somebody to run a crew. Chad's not qualified, but he can stay up late at night. So we'll put him on night shift. And what, what, how bad could he do? You know, yeah. so that was, yeah. that was how I um, did that. So stayed there, got a couple of patents and stuff like that on machine design. Really? Um, Interesting. Yeah, I loved it. It's, it's, it was not as glamorous. Like I thought there would be like a whole ceremony, but it was just a letter in the mail. And my company that I work for uh, so owned the patent. So owned the patent like, anyways. Right, right. They were right. like, good job. You know, here's a new mechanical pencil for you, which is great. They paid for it. So I mean, I'm yeah. not bitter. Yeah, but uh, great job. Great job. Then uh, was, was uh, I met my wife while I was a junior in college um, and uh, married her, you know, a year out of college. And uh, came in one day and she's like, you know, hey, I think I'm ready to start a family. I was really enjoying the practicing. And um, so she said, uh, she said, uh, she goes, oh, you know, when do you think? And we had talked about we wanted to have, you know, children and stuff like that. And yeah, she said, so, so what do you how do you feel? And I was like, well, you know, I'm an engineer. So I said, look, let me think about this. Let me do the math. I mean, I had already had a plan. So I, I like, can you know, afford hey, 1.5 you know, children, but only for three years. Wanted, she's like, I want more than two. And I said, okay, I was a middle child. I'm not doing that to anybody else. Ah. So that puts us at four because anything over that is just unbelievably crazy. And so I was like, oh, so I guess we're gonna have four kids. And let's say we have a kid every two years. And I want the last one out of the house before my 401k kicks in. Oh my God. So I about calculated. I was like, okay, well, I guess we need to get pregnant this summer. And she looked at me with love in her eyes and said, that's how you plan a family? <laughs> That's very, that is so engineer. It it's was that not is, even funny. You're just, you're a hopeless romantic. Uh, and it I was, hope. it was, that's, that's what we do. And, uh, and, and what was the worst is she gave me a bunch of heck about that, but I'll have, you know, we had a kid every two years and we got pregnant that summer <laughs> and we have two boys and two girls. Oh, so you can argue with the formula if you want, but math doesn't lie. No, that's right. That is perfectly balanced. Now I see why you polish concrete because at the end it is beautiful, consistent. Right. It's that's just, right. yeah. How that? How the heck? By the way, does all this story because there's this not a straight path. 
military college, by the way, I'm glad you did that. Thank you so much for your service or contribution to the oh, service. Yeah, doing yeah, that because yeah. You didn't go in the real military, just fake military, just military based college. So, sure. Yeah. But still, you know, yeah. Yeah. learn to march and polish your shoes and stuff like that. Well, I was there on an army scholarship, but I had a, I actually ended up, uh, uh, I don't have a thyroid. So I lost my scholarship, which was a bummer because I was looking forward to not paying for college, but, uh, because you so didn't have because your thyroid got removed. Yeah, I had my thyroid. I got sick and had to have it taken out. And they're like, "Well, if you got captured, you wouldn't be able to survive without your medicine." I was like, "Yeah, but I'd be like the best POW ever. My metabolism would drop, and I would sleep all day." <laughs> um, but uh, it didn't spell. You know, but, <laughs> they didn't like that. No. Um, and so, how does this path take you? First of all, to business ownership, because everybody listening here is a business owner. That's this show is just for business owners in construction and contracting. And we all have our path that got there. Some of us had an unplanned family and we were a painter at the time and now we're just painters 25 years later. Uh, some of us you know, went to engineering school, some of us didn't finish high school and we're still running multi-million dollar companies. Everybody's got a different path, but how did your path go from a regimented engineering military background to business ownership and specifically concrete polishing? The last thing I ever wanted. Uh, my dad owned his own business for forever and he was a workaholic and I had inherited that ability and desire to, I enjoy work, don't mind it. So I would spend all my time doing it and I get lost in it. And so I would look up and 16 or 18 hours are gone. Um, and uh, so I knew that that's not what I wanted. I wanted to be around my kids and do stuff like that. And so, yeah. um, so I went into corporate. I thought it was easy. I thought it was great. I was successful. At it. And when you, when you're willing to travel, it was fantastic. But um, I knew that, you know, everybody around me that traveled as much as I did, their kids were a bit of a mess and, um, and their families were, were, were pretty difficult to deal with. Yeah. And so my wife and I agreed I'd do it until we had kids. And so uh, we, we had the first one. And, uh, and then they said, well, you know, hey, Chad, you can just be a regular engineer here at the company. And it was made abundantly clear to me. I didn't quite fit in with those guys. Ah. Um, <laughs> so I liked them, you know, in, in spurts. And uh and so I left there, took a consulting job, and then um, they were like, well, you're not the same as other engineers as a rule. We want to get you out and do sales. And that meant travel. And again, I was like, well, I'm not traveling. Yeah. So I left that company and my wife said, well, you can do anything you want. Just don't go work for your dad. So I went to work for my dad. For a while. <laughs> yeah. And uh, your house was, must just be topsy-turvy because your, your wife is obviously a very patient woman. I like to think of it as I am consistent, at least that I'm consistently inconsistent. Um, but uh, so it was good in that, you know, my dad in a swimming pool business. I grew up doing that. And he also oh, owned a few okay. companies and stuff like that. And um, and so we would replace pool liners. And that, that led to people saying, well, the pool looks great, but now the concrete looks bad. I started looking for ways to improve concrete. Uh, okay. Um, then I started my own company um, with the help of a contractor I was working for who just said, hey, look, you know, phenomenal guy. And he's like, look, I got these two big jobs. I'll give them to you, but only if you start your own company, because this working for family thing is not a good idea. And uh, so, so hold on, let me, this is interesting because we've got people listening to this show who went to work with their family are maybe still working with their family and not sure what life looks like next, or they're in the family business and want to change it. So you've, you've got an interesting background here that some other people are going to find some cool stuff in. So can we back up for a second? You're working with your dad. How, all respect on the table, how was that going? It was, it was terrible. It was um, because, and, and, and we both shared blame. My, my dad had been doing this for, you know, uh, you know, 20 years, 25 years, 30 mm. years, something like that. I mean, he'd been in business a long time. Very smart guy. Um, went to Virginia Tech. So I have a little issue with that, but otherwise very smart guy. <laughs> um, the, uh, so the, um, he had his ways of doing things. Great salesman. I love him to death. Terrible manager of people. Terrible. You know, he's just, everybody loves him. The guy he's talking to on the phone right now, he is totally committed to until he answers the phone again. Then he's committed to that guy and that customer. Oh, that. So that's very difficult. And so he's a I, hunter. He's a good he, hunter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right? All yeah. Um, and just expects people to do good jobs, but he doesn't hold anyone accountable. And, and I know these because these are my faults too. Hmm. So um, then you bring in a kid with a big personality, a huge ego, and who's like telling you all the things you're doing wrong. And, uh, you know, there, there's going to be some butting of heads. That's true. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'm right. You know, like I, 
it was things that needed to be done, um, but they go against his grain. So now you're trying to change a leopard's spots at the direction of somebody else. And that's, you know, nobody likes that. No. So uh, we could be family or we could be business in business together. And I chose that we would be family. And eventually he came around to that as well. And it was, and we had a couple of years where it didn't go well, but yeah. Yeah. So, and there's people again, listening who might be in the same or similar situation. Do you remember having the conversation where and oh, yeah. the conversation where things started to split or where it was agreed that we were going to move apart? How difficult was that? How did you prepare yourself for that? And again, I'm saying this because there's some people listening right now that have cleaned the wax out of their ears and they are leaning forward to hear your answer. I think it's way more avoidable. I could go through it again now and it'd be so much easier. Really? Um, the really? It was terrible. It was, um, and, and I say terrible, but my dad's not a bad guy. My family is closed. No, but it's an awkward situation. Yeah, it created a winter of about five years long where we didn't do a lot of things together. But he came to it, and, and I knew that it was bad when, um, when uh, it started to get to be a very personal. And I found that you know, my dad's really super easygoing, so I knew that I could tweak my dad by using my mom. And that's not when you start manipulating family members around and you're trying to get and it becomes personal and you're trying to maneuver. Mm. That is not a way you can't get around that in a family and family business is still family. I think where we could have done a whole lot better is and it's ironic coming from an engineer. We should have had numbers that we made decisions on, not feelings or plans or anything like that. If you can get to numbers that's been a hard lesson for me. Then you yeah. can manage it. Like, can I can I interrupt you for a second on this? I agree, and I'm not a numbers guy. So I think your dad is probably a great relationship building person, very outgoing. Uh, you know, can make friends with anybody. You're obviously you have a lot of those skills too, but you're a numbers guy. You're an engineering guy, and so your logic and he's emotion. Exactly, and that I mean, can be difficult. And and so and yet I still say having the numbers is a great way to enter into that conversation. But along with that are things that, that I do as a coach, which is, you know, put a strategic plan in place. So everybody's thoughts and ideas are on the table. And then once we agree on whatever those thoughts and ideas are, that's what we're going to do this year. We're all going to move towards that. And, and it either becomes clear that we're going to, or clear that we're not. And it opens up that conversation, which is why I was asking, how did you have that? It's such a tough convo because this is your dad. And like you said, you're either family or you're in business, but still, you're still family. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I think you're right. I think in hindsight, what I wish we had done is you know, similar to like what you're talking about, a, a coach, somebody who becomes a, a, a translator, you know, okay. you need both because yes, those are very different personalities, but they are powerful when combined. You know, this is the EOS in integrator visionary thing. You know, this is when they're together, you know, yeah. two and two is six. And when they're separate, two and two is like negative five. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would think like if somebody's in that situation now, I said, man, get you a, get a coach or somebody who can kind of mediate and then set down numbers that say, you know, what, you know, what do we want sales revenue? What do we want quotes? How do we want, you know, what is our activities? And then let's get delineated, documented processes. So then when you look at it, you don't say, hey, you didn't do your job. You look at it and say, our process wasn't followed. That's a much different conversation. Um and when you can talk about the process rather than the person, people don't get as defensive about a process. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that, it's that still a tough conversation, but it's easier. It is. It's not emotional. Um, and, and it gives you a lot of off ramps. Okay. We can change the process. Yeah. We can tweak a process. We can involve another person. You know, we can look for these refinements because everything then is about helping the process work, not changing who you are as a person that, not, not attacking the way that you handle things or don't document things or, or stuff like that. So it is that structure gives a lot of comfort to get away from it. You know, it's like my wife and I have it in our marriage, you know, we're like, look, we have clear lines. I'm supposed to put money in the account. She's <laughs> supposed to make sure that that money Jeez. lasts to the end of the month. Oh, okay. I thought you clear could. delineation. I, I thought don't you were going to set her up for as a... long as we don't need extra, you know, <laughs> yeah. we ran out of, we ran out of month before we ran out of money. Yeah, um, no, it's a God love February. Yeah. I mean, the whole Valentine's Day thing, which every year, I got, it's, I, it's coming up. 
Oh wait, it passed. What am I talking about? It's already passed. Yeah, that's that, that's the way I live. It's coming up. Wait, it's passed. Oh, it's already oh. gone. <laughs> yeah. The um the the that whole family business thing. If you were to give us advice, if that was the whole topic of the show, is how to have that conversation with a, a family member or a business partner, because others are maybe not family members, but they've got a business partner. If you have to have a tough conversation with your significant business partner, other, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. How, what would your suggestion be now, knowing what you've gone through? Get somebody else involved. Get, yeah. Th- there's no way to get, um, there's no way to remove that emotion from it. So get a, a mediator, a neutral party that can, that can kind of monitor these situations and, and, and keep you out of the extremes of the thermometer, you know, like don't, yeah. don't let things get too heated, find pause breaks, be an objective listener. Um, Keep business business. Yeah, yeah. Keep, Keep business. Family business. business has still got to be business to be successful. Yeah. Um, family is just people you know a lot better. Um, and sometimes you know things that you shouldn't know about somebody you're in business with. You know, oh it's my like, goodness. I don't need to know all of your, if I, if I knew you less, we could get along better, you know, because I wouldn't know everything that irritates the hell out of you and try to use that to manipulate a situation. Yeah. And I, I do that the same thing to friends. Like whenever we have people that get married and stuff like that, we do the same thing. Get a financial advisor just so you, that you can talk about these goals. I mean, any, anytime you talk about money among people that are oh, connected like that. Money's cold. Money yeah, you, is cold. But talking about money gets hot. Yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Just like you said, numbers are numbers don't lie. So, okay, we've gotten through the family thing now and you decide to start your own business. You meet a mentor or a friend and he says to you, hey, listen, I've got these two gigs, these two jobs. I'd like you to take them, but you need to incorporate to take them. Uh, how did that conversation come about and how did you make that leap to those, those two? Great, great mentor. His name is Tony Greenhow. He's a concrete contractor, um, phenomenal guy. And, um, and he basically was just kind of watching me get in that family dynamic he knew uh, about it. He had had a bad partnership. It wasn't family, but he had had a bad partnership. And for whatever reason, he just looked at me and said, oh, you could do this, but you need to get out of there. It's for your own. Wow. Good. He literally He's said. He's a wise man. He is. And he said, yeah. I will only give you this job, these two jobs, if you do it as your own company. It had nothing to do with insurance or, or finances or anything. Like that. It was solely based on a guy looked at me and said, this is the best thing for you. Wow. So I'll give you a difficult choice. And it was. Um, it was the impetus. I needed that job, you know, at the time. I mean, you know, it was, you know, I, we had three kids, my wife was pregnant and stuff like that. And there was plenty of reasons for me to be going to work every day. Um, but he said, this is what I'll do. And, and it was a, it was a good choice because it was an, it was, a, it was a fortuitous event that sounds like a manipulative thing to do. It sounds like he was kind of like trying to run me, but it wasn't at all. It was somebody who cared. And said, yeah. hey, I'll do it. I mean, not only will I do it, I'll give you a deposit. That's never happening in commercial construction. I mean, he was as great as it could ever have been. Wow. That's a great man. He's, he's left a legacy and you're carrying it on, which is nice. Oh, like, you know what I mean? You made a successful business out of it. How big is your crew now, if I can ask? So we were running uh, 16 people in the field um, prior to COVID hitting. We've downgraded now. And now we're doing a lot more subcontracting as well. So we have about n- n- eight people in the office. We have uh, maybe six field guys that are employees. And then we yeah. have subcontractors. Outside so, of that. And, and the reason I asked that question is because what did you say his name was Mr. Green, Green, Tony Green, yeah. Greenhow. Look at the impact that he had by making, by, by, you know, truly being a servant leader and saying what needed to be said with love in his heart, obviously. And now look at the impact of that it's, suggestion on his part. And it was great because it almost sounds weird to to say this, but to state it, he's a minority contractor. So this is a black male contractor who did this for a, uh, you know, like the opposite of what you would think would happen if you take yeah. all the crazy things you hear. You know, just a just a great guy. I mean, he had no need to do it. He was already successful. And he's great. Yeah. Well, that's a wise man. That's a wise I can man. Only imagine other people he's done it for. I yeah, exactly, know. exactly. So, um, and was the job polishing concrete? It was staining and sealing concrete. So we were oh, using so cool it decks, right? and have it. This is before I'd never heard about an auto scrubber. So I was doing like 3,500 square feet and then I needed to clean it. And so, you know, they make these walk behind Zamboni looking auto yeah. scrubber. Man, that's a great way to clean 3,500 feet. All I knew of was a mop and a bucket. And I had practiced that in college. TSP so. and a mop and a bucket? 
getting after it, man. Oh, wow. And, uh, it was funny. It was, it was great. And, uh, and the projects went really well. That was our good, my, kind of my startup money for business. And, uh, and then it just so, kind of launched from there. And so what happened there? Yeah. Did you suddenly realize I look, I need to market and get more gigs or did people poke their head over the fence and say, Hey, I noticed you're doing my fences uh, or my neighbor's uh, uh, deck. Huh? Why don't you come on over? Like, how did, how did you start getting more jobs? So it was a lot of just um, meeting people and um, Tony knew tons of people. He interviewed, he introduced me to other people as well. And then once you're in that culture of, I can be a, a fixer of problems. Like I'm a solutions finder, but that was because my background was so different than other people around me that it was a great way for me to like, Hey, you know, no, I can come up with a way to fix that. So then I became the guy that fixed things. And then I became the guy that just tried to do them right the first time. Um, and, and it just grew from there. Polishing actually started because we were doing coatings and, and stuff like that. And one of my friends in North Carolina in the business, he's like, Hey, you should check out grinding. And, uh, that way you can, to get ready for your coatings. I was like, okay. Yeah. I called a rep. The rep said, yeah, I'll bring you a grinder to try it out. He showed up on site and he's like, here's the grinder. We just got it. I don't know anything about it. I'm a brand new rep. And all these other things came with it. So you can have all of those. Just let me know what you figure out. So I was supposed to be grinding this lady's bathroom. Yeah. And, then, and she said, uh, she says, okay, I grind it. And then the diamond pads that are there. And I was like, can I try something? She goes, yeah, sure. Have at it. Super nice lady. Wow. So I was in there and I end up learning how to diamond polish on her bathroom. And it turned out really good. I sent a picture of it to an architect that I had met. And the architect said, hey, you know, we'd like for you to bid polishing our office. Well, that's uh, 35,000 square feet of one of the top architecture firms in Richmond. And no I was like, pressure. Hey, all you've done is a bathroom. All done is a bathroom. Seven square feet. And now you're going to do. Go, I go in and make a little sample with that little machine. Get the job. I call the rep and say, look, we need much bigger equipment. He goes, okay, I know somebody sells bigger equipment. We have it delivered at night on a rider truck. I told them they couldn't come in boxes or they had to come off the truck looking like I had used it before. So the rep comes in, he delivers it. Fast. We put him on there and we learn how to use it, run the job. And uh, and then we just kind of take off from there. I mean, it was, it was, that is such a bad way to start a business. But you know, <laughs> no, I don't know. I think hustling is a good way to go. Because like, you, you were hustling and built that way, you know, you were yeah. hustling. But uh, also I can tell from listening to you that you're going to make it work because it didn't yeah. all go smoothly, right? You had pads oh, come right. apart. You had machines not work. You had, you know, you're, I'm sure you were there and power suddenly cuts out. Things happen, but you're also the guy that goes to make sure you're going to live up to your word. I think that, I think what I learned then was in, in my dad was always a hard worker. And so I think what made that easier was I was like, okay, it takes hard work to start, but then you have to shift. It's kind of like table stakes, you know, all right, that's great that you're here. You're a hard worker. That's we're all hard workers. You're not yeah. different than us because otherwise you wouldn't have made it here, but then you've got to work smarter. And it took me a long time to learn that one. And that's figuring out what you do that, you know, it's the old uh, strategic coach, unique ability, you know, what is it that you do better than anybody else? What is it you really do? Not what you think you do better mm. than anybody else, because that's a bigger list for me. Yeah. Uh, what do you really do better than anyone else? And then you got to get everything else away from you. Uh, you got to get somebody else doing it. Yeah. And that's that's tricky. You know, and, and once you can do that, then your company and your business really can explode. So let's let's think about that as a lesson for you know people who are listening to the show. There's the question. What is it you do that's different or unique than anyone else? And you might say you're a really good estimator, but other people could do estimating. Or maybe you are the world's greatest estimator and you need to have somebody else doing other things. Maybe you're a great leader. And, and quite often, it's just that it's a little thing. You've carved a little piece of the world out for yourself where you're really, really good. And it's okay to delegate all the other stuff. And it's okay. I struggled a long time to find out what it was that I was better at. And it's because everybody asked me the question. And whenever we tried to get this, they're like, so what is it that you're better at than anybody else? Well, my, I had a hard time answering. I don't like thinking that I'm better than somebody or anything like that. And so I had a lot wrapped around that. When I reframed the question and when I finally got a good answer was, what could you spend all day doing hmm. and never run out of energy and never be disgruntled or unhappy while you were doing it? Wow. That's a different thing because there's things I'm better at than other people, but I hate doing it. 
You know, it's like, uh, apparently I'm the best at refilling the dog food at the house, but I hate doing it. I'm okay with my son <laughs> doing a little bit less good of a job of it because I don't want to do it. So I don't think it's always, what are you the best at? It's what do you enjoy and can put in, and it doesn't burn much energy for you wow. to do it, but yet you produce. And for me, that was sales and relationship building. So I could do, I could spend all day. I could walk into rooms. I don't know people. I could leave with friends. Yeah. I could do all of that stuff. I'm a really good at polishing concrete. Yeah, I'm a pretty good guy at polishing an edge on concrete. But if I'm the best that there is of that, there's just not much money or capacity for no, me. No, it's a it's a technical thing. It's it's a tech thing, right? It's it's always going to be limited by the amount that a technician gets paid. This goes back to Michael Gerber in the yeah. E-Myth Revisited, right? There's the manager, the entrepreneur, and the technician. All right, exactly. yeah, sorry, and the entrepreneurs first, actually, entrepreneur, manager, and technician. But that technician is always a limiting factor. When you're really good as a concrete, what's the best concrete polisher in the world making? What's their okay. hourly wage? $38 an hour if they're okay. non-union. There you go. Thousand dollars an hour if they're union. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's call it 40 bucks an hour, but then let's double it and say $80 an hour for the best concrete polisher in the world. Top in the world. Mm -hmm. They're going to polish the concrete at Oprah's house. They're going to make 80 bucks an hour. How much is the contractor who sold the job to Oprah to polish the concrete? And that's where the unlimited capacity, the unlimited earning potential, the creativity, the ability to build a company, that's where that comes in. And I'm not taking away anything from the technicians, but I'm speaking to those of us listening to the show who are still in technician mode. If you're doing that technical work, if you're swinging the hammer, turning the wrenches or what do you call it? Pushing the polisher. Pushing the grinder, yeah. That's uh, that's awful alliteration right there. If I was pushing the uh, <laughs> polisher or the grinder, I'm limiting my opportunity to grow the business because I'm I'm on the tools. I have to move into entrepreneur mode. And I think that in, in and it took me a long time to figure out, you know, who are you and who are you not? And then also don't assume, like I used to think it was humble. I thought if I could do it, anybody could do it. But that didn't make me humble. It just makes me wrong. There are things that I can do that you cannot do. And there are things that you can do that I definitely cannot do. And when you find that, you know, I have an assistant and she is fantastic. You know, she can do a calendar. She can set my schedule. She got us set up to do this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the last thing she wants to do is be thrust in a room full of people she doesn't know and, and be dictated to meet someone. Well, the last thing I want to do, I mean, for all my math skills, a calendar is like a mystery to me. I don't know why I can't get a calendar to work for me. But she can, and it's okay. And she lives and loves to do that. You know, we have a bookkeeper who lives and loves to like reconcile books. Man, oh, I would bless die. them. Bless those people. I, I don't know what's wrong with them, but I'm glad they've got it. I I agree because they call it a job or a career. I would call that a life sentence. Yeah, but they love it, and they would again. They would hate what I do. And because they're because they love it, they are better at it than you're gonna ever be. Right. Um, even no matter how good at it you are, because you're going to grow to resent it. Um, so that's, that's, you know, so when you can find that and, and then, so when you figure out what those people are and you, and you say, okay, well, that, I'm, I'm going to give that to somebody else. It's not guilty. You're freeing them to do what they love to do too, but it's okay to be a technician. Like if you're a technician and you're like, Hey, I'm thinking about starting my own company, but I don't want the risk and I don't like that. And I really love coaching my kid's soccer team. That's okay. You know, but don't go to that technician and say, I need to make you a manager because what I would want if I were you is to be a manager and I need to make you into one so that I'm making you grow and stuff like that. When all he wants to do is be a technician and then focus on his soccer coaching. Yeah, absolutely. You can't force you know, other people's visions. It's got to be what they want. Yeah, because not everybody, you're not, you know, like in your audience, if you're the business owners, they are not, you guys are unique, super unique. And people don't, there's a ton of people that do not want to be you. Now, some of them, there's a lot of people who want to have what you have, but they don't want to do what you do. That's well that's said. Okay. Yeah, and they don't want to pay the price to, to do it, right? Yeah, and you wouldn't be happy, you know, that's, that's what they tell us. Like, you know, yeah, I might be either the worst employee or the best employee. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, I was a pretty good employee at one point in time. I don't know what I'd be like. Now. Oh, no, I, I'll tell you now, I'm the worst employee in the world. And the reason I am, is because I think more like the owner or the president of a company. Yeah. I understand the logic of the owner or the president. And so to me being, you know, and I've been an employee, I have been for a long time. I worked in corporate as well. And we've all had jobs. I remember, I remember getting in trouble at McDonald's. 
And I, it was just a side comment that I made. It did, I was just making it as a joke. But you got to think I was a, how old are you at McDonald's? 16 years old, flipping burgers. Like this is the old McDonald's where you're still flipping with the spatula, sweating on the grill. Nobody needs to hear that, but it happened. How much and are you making at this point in time? Like $2.67 an hour. That was my, oh. yeah, it might've been two thirty seven, but it was under three bucks. And just as a side comment to the other guy working, I said, you know what would be better? Instead of paying us a dollar um, per hour, they should give us like a penny per burger. I was whisked off the floor so fast and in an office. And this little tiny manager who didn't even come up to my chin is barking at me. Don't you talk like that in here? We don't talk like that. You can't talk like I was like, what? I don't even know what I said. But yeah, I was I was clearly not meant for for that job. Yeah, it's- and many others and many others. But, you know, like you said, for some people, entrepreneurship or business ownership is just not for them either. Everybody's cut a different way. You've got to follow the path that you, you've got. For people listening to this show, I think we're all pr- pretty clearly set that business ownership is for us. And we're all trying to find a way to be now better at business because otherwise they wouldn't go look up Profit Tool Belt podcast. Yeah. You got to be weird to go look that up. And yeah, then to subscribe and then to listen to you and I natter on about, <laughs> it's right. right? It's, a, it's just, a, it's a different way of seeing the world. But I, l- allow me to add this. That makes it hard too, because it's hard to find Chad Gill to talk to. It's hard. And I've, I'm sorry, I forgot your, the gentleman, the mentor. Tony, Tony Greeno. It's, it's hard to find the Tony Greenows of the world. It's hard to find the Dominic Rubinos of the world because we talk weird. We formulate our thoughts different. When everybody else sees the news and says, oh, my, everything's down. I was watching the news today and everything's down. In my head and probably in yours, I'm thinking, huh, I wonder what's up. If new housing starts are down, what's up? Oh, renovations are up. Well, that's good news. But everybody else gets sucked into the negative news. People on these, in this kind of circle that we're in, we just see the world differently. We talk differently. We formulate our thoughts differently. And we take different actions. It's important. You, you, I think one of the most important things you can do as a business owner is to get into groups, whether it's EO or a coaching thing or a forum or what, get into places where you're around people who see a world of abundance and opportunity. I mean, you will look at it and you'll sit in a room with people who are like, hey man, there's something going on in you know, the war in Ukraine. Somewhere along the way, that's generating opportunity. And there's a person who's looking at it and it's terrible and it's sad and it's destructive, but there's also opportunity there and you can use that opportunity to create good things. Yeah. Uh, Anything from that? I mean, food shortages, you know, everything that looks like bad news, there's opportunity there where you can not only make money and that's the people say, serve as well, but you can serve and you can help, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, capitalism is probably, uh, or greed is probably fed more people on the planet than any other emotion, you know, but that doesn't make greed good. I'm not saying greed is good. No, 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 no. It's okay to pursue opportunity and and make sure you can do good with it. Uh, people on this show have heard this before, but I, I, you know, this is the first time you and I are having this kind of conversation. But my old business partner is a guy named Brian Tracy, and he's a re- he's a prolific author. He's written seventy plus books. And one of them is Eat That Frog: The Psychology of Achievement, The Psychology of Selling. Uh, anyways, one of the things that Brian said, and he was challenged. I was in the audience uh, as he was challenged, and and somebody said, Brian, what can we do? You know, you talk about wealth all the time. What can we do to help the needy? And without even batting an eye, Brian turned to him and said, don't be one of them. And at first, it kind of shocks you to hear that. And then you're, you know what, he's right. I can't give unless I have to give. Now, I know the the story of giving alms and stuff like that. The person who gives, who has the least. I understand all that. But if I really want to have an impact, I want to build a hospital wing. Well, people build hospital wings because they have tax problems, my friends. It's not because of any other reason. So if I want to build a hospital wing that will help thousands of people and employ hundreds for dozens of years, then I need to have those kind of problems. That's how I can help more people. And that's what it is. There was a, and it's just a frame of mind. There was a guy that uh, I was talking to the other day and he told me a story about, he was in the pool and he was in a lot of debt. I think it was a uh, Pish Patel. I forget who I was interviewing him, but anyway, he's like, and so he's like, I need to get out of debt. So he swam and he would swim for exercise. So he's constantly swimming. He's like, I want to get out of debt. I want to get out of debt. I want to get out of debt. But all his brain kept hearing was debt, debt, debt. Oh, negative language. And he's like, he just couldn't shake this debt cycle. And so then he's like, I got in the pool one day and I was like, maybe I'm tired of hearing the word debt. So he started swimming saying, I want to be rich. I want to be rich. I want to be rich. And so he focused on the positive. 
And of course, I don't even know Pish Patel. If that's the guy, I can't remember who it was, but this guy is very, very wealthy, very successful, has helped thousands of people. But it's because he's like, it's finding that drive of drive to positive versus, you know, the fear yeah. of negative is not the same as being embraced by positive. So I, I agree with that. And I'll come back to this with something that others have heard on the show before. But generally, as leaders, we have a four inch problem. And now I know where your mind is going. And <laughs> that's not what we're talking about, gentlemen. Uh, it's the space between our ears. Mindset is everything. It is everything. And you have four children, and we're not going to call their names out. But think about the different mindsets of your four different kids and where that's already taking them. I can see that with my kids. I'm sure it's the same with yours. And we can see that all around us. So I have a saying that goes along with what your, uh, your quote there from Pitch Patel is, is that what I say to myself when no one is listening is what the world sees when everyone is watching. I like it. So what you say to yourself when no one is listening, the world sees. I like that. When everyone is watching. And so Pitch Patel, if, if that if we got the name right there, hopefully you hopefully did. Uh, if not, uh, proper credit to proper person. But what, what I say to myself when no one is listening, so what's my internal language? I'm a great leader. I build companies. I deliver great cabinetry. I'm a, the best concrete polisher. And our concrete polishing team is the best in the world. When I say that to myself, everybody sees that. And we just naturally work towards that. But if, if all I say to myself is, oh my God, my team is horrendous. We can't get anything right. Then people see that we're horrendous and we can't get anything right. I have to internalize that to make it come true. And whatever I'm internalizing, people will see. Yeah, that's very similar. It's like, whether you think you can or you can't, yeah, either that's way, right. you're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. I think and, that's uh, Henry Ford. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it, it, but that stuff really does matter. And, and for people that own companies, like, I think the trap, the thing that I regret is that I spent, you know, all of my childhood watching my dad and thinking I never want to have my own company. And I spent the first probably 10 years of my company thinking I never would, I will never encourage my children to have their own company. Now, and it's because I didn't realize how to run a company in a way that is conducive to life and conducive to all the things yeah, that you can yeah. do. Now I'm looking at my children going, you will definitely have to start your own companies. And if these kids don't get straightened, your biggest problem is going to be, you're not going to have any employees. That's okay. Your dad knows <laughs> robotics, but it's, a, you know, it's like, it's, it's, you got to build a company that models, you know, for me, a big motivator and changing of my mindset was I needed to build a company that would show my children that running a company wasn't miserable, wasn't bad. Um, and it could be done in a way that you could still have a family, you could still enjoy things, you can still, and there's lots and lots of advantages, not all tax advantages, but there's a lot of tax advantages too. But <laughs> still. There's tax advantages, there's time advantages, there is uh, visa travel points advantages, which are very nice. Yeah. There's flexibility. You can choose whichever 80 hours a week you want to work. Yeah, all of them are better. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to work 80 hours a week. Some people just like to do it. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, business now and, and finding a way to, to, to do that has been much better. And I, and I constantly tell my children now, yeah, I, I expect you to start something because the world needs people to start them. I think, I think my kids will start something too. Uh, my son uh, sits outside of my home office when I'm working from home and he's playing his video games, but every once in a while, just for fun, he mimics me, like he'll, he'll imitate something that I say. Well, Dominic, I think you might be below the line there because below the line people place blame and they make excuses and they're in denial. I'm like, oh, you're 13, man. And he just rips me on these things. Uh, anyways, hey, listen, you're so interesting to talk to. And it turns out you have a podcast of your own as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how people can find you in this big wide world if they want to hear more? We more do. Chat? Uh, so I do. I have I actually have two podcasts. We have one that's specifically related to concrete and polishing and grinding. So if you're looking to get a good night's sleep, you can turn <laughs> that one on. That's called, this is, it's called, it's called the, this is concrete podcast. Um, it's, it's the, it's the website for my polishing company. Um, and then uh, we used to do decorative stuff all the time and people would knock on and go, this is concrete. And I was like, dot com. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's a, nice. a home show generated my email, address, my web address. That's always good. Um, and then the other one is um, get the intel. We built a software package that helps document job sites for commercial contractors. And get the intel is uh, is a podcast that talks more about this kind of thing, like running a business, uh, 
creating um, culture and stuff like that, systems, documentation. Yeah, um, yeah, documentation these days is a big part of business. Um, both the documented people, documented processes, documented jobs, <laughs> documenting of, change orders, documenting you know, site conditions. Very litigious, we are in a very litigious business. Yeah, yeah. But so, at the same time, there's opportunity. Always opportunity. Yeah. Well, I mean, you figure it, just, you know, and people are like, hey, that, you know, my kids will say, well, should I be a lawyer? Because I know, you, you know, you're around lawyers a lot. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, if you can afford a lawyer, why spend all the time becoming one? <laughs> so it's like, That's a great answer, by the way. Know, and yeah. by the way, you can't afford a lawyer. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm yeah, try to stay, try to stay away from lawyers as much as possible and use them sparingly. And I say that, and Carolyn Cromines has been on the show a couple times, and uh, she's a lawyer who does a lot in, in uh, the construction space. But yeah, law- lawyers are a tool in the toolbox, but they, sh- they sh- in my mind, they should not be the first tool in our toolbox. And I think it kind of goes down to like nuclear deterrence, you know, build, you know, be prepared for war so that you never have to go. I'll tell you, this is something I've learned about lawyers, and that you got to spend a lot of money to figure this one out. But when the time does come to hire a lawyer, hire a really, really expensive one because there's a pecking order in the law community and they know who bills $500 an hour and who bills 125. And when those two are in the room, the guy or gal at 125 is shaking in their boots because they know that $500 lawyer is going to eat them alive. And so you might be tempted if you ever do need a lawyer to go and try to get a budget lawyer, but we're not watching Aaron Brockovich here, folks. We are, we're talking about business. You got to, if the time comes, you got to do this right. And I had a very expensive attorney. We were doing a, a suit and, and he asked me, we were going to go into negotiation. He said, uh, he said, he said, he said, oh, Chad, uh, which, <laughs> Chad, am I, which Chad am I going into this with? I was like, what do you mean? Which Chad? He goes, am I going into this chat with the, with the business guy who's in here to come out with the best business advantage situation? He goes, or am I going in here with this deeply principled emotional guy who's going to say, I will burn it all down for honor and joy and whatever, you know, like teach somebody a lesson. And he goes, because if that guy is the one that's walking in the room, he goes, there's no need for me to go. And he said, but if the business guy's walking in, he goes, then we have a chance at success. So don't ever go to court thinking you're going to teach somebody a lesson. It's kind of like Facebook. You're not going to change anybody's mind in court or on Facebook. <laughs> What, we're going to do what a, a, what a great and, analogy. That is a great analogy. Uh, it's a court is not where you change minds or teach people lessons. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, like a, it. it's a good place. Um, all right. So we know how to get in touch with you, right? You have two websites. This is concrete. And how's that spelled, by the way? Because so your, your T-shirt or your, your golf shirt said concrete. Yes, concrete. Um, but the website is this is concrete, like the material, dot com. Um, and then, uh, field recon that's, that's workforce recon.com. Um, that's, that's for the, uh, the app business that we do, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it's a, you know, either way, or you just do like my wife does and just send me a text and let me know I'm late meeting you somewhere. I probably won't even know and just show up anyway. <laughs> yeah. Freak us all out. Yeah. Well, Chad, thank you so much for being on the show. I understand I'm going to be a guest on your show coming up soon. Absolutely. If yeah. I made the cut, I mean, you might change your mind after this but we'll see. yeah no i think we're i think we're good to, i think we're good to yeah. go i mean we might have to get your kid on here though i want to meet this one that's like oh, yeah have you clean your room you look dumb i think you're a little above the line there <laughs> 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 that kid is still alive after saying that i need to talk oh, to him <laughs> he's funny i had him do i do dad jokes on my show here as part of the intro just to get people laughing and uh i think it was last summer we just sat down and recorded a whole bunch of dad jokes together and oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, it's just fun. we did that. We I just did that to my daughter this morning. I hit her with a dad joke I had heard on the internet somewhere or something. And so it's fun to pass those back and forth. Oh yeah, and you know they're corny, and you deliver them with oh, just with pride and joy. Oh yeah, pride and joy. Kids want right. to have nursing parents. They want. You know what? My kids used to think I'm tall and funny, and they now realize no, none of those things are true. And so <laughs> that's I'm fine with it. I'm fine. That's with it. Right. That's right. All right, Chad, thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to being on yours soon, too. Thanks, Dom. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too.